that's how you know I'm not Slips through my fingers Everything I've got Well I'm doing the things that you do To get better But my moods are still changing Just like the weather So if I look fine That's how you know I'm Thinking of dying, you won't see me crying, that don't work with me. I just have these thoughts, and they're all that I got. And no, they are not saying nice things to me. So if I look fine, that's how you know I'm not. ecstasy and kids do it because they think it's fun but they don't realize that even doing something one time can turn into a really dangerous lifestyle how we first found out was i caught him stealing my husband was in the shower and my son josh he went into the bedroom and i literally caught him bending over pulling money out of my husband's pants pocket and I said, what are you doing? And he just looked at me and he was frozen. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm like, I'm not gonna have a thief in my home. You've gotta go. And that's when he said, mom, I have a problem. I believe I was 18 years old when I took my first drug. And then I didn't stop, you know, until seven years later. And it flew by. I didn't even realize seven years had gone by. I thought, oh, it's just been two or three years. Did I believe that they might smoke weed or drink alcohol? Yes, not naive. I wasn't naive in that respect. I never contemplated that my kids would become a drug user. It was not on our radar at all. I never saw it coming. And even when I was confronted with it, I actually didn't believe it. When he told us that he had a problem with drugs, I thought he was lying. I thought he was saying that to cover up 
that he was stealing from us. One of the things that I see a lot of the time is kids that started using medication that wasn't prescribed for them out of their parents or a friend's parents' medicine cabinet. And they're going in, they're looking at the prescription bottle and they're saying, may cause drowsiness, do not operate heavy machinery. And they go, oh, that's it right there. That's what you're looking for. And that's where a kid starts. When I started using drugs, it was just whatever was available at the party I was at. And it really started out for me with ecstasy because that was a party drug. You would go to a party, you would take some ecstasy, you would feel amazing and have energy and you would be loving everyone there. It has nothing to do with how smart you are, it has nothing to do with how athletic you are, how popular you are, how wealthy or poor you are. It has to do uh, with the want to fit in, that group mentality. We like company as human beings. We like to be accepted and we quest for that throughout our lives is acceptance. So especially when you're young, you don't really know anything about the world and you're just kind of growing up and you have all these hormones surging through your head and your body, you don't, you don't really, and you don't know anything, you have no experience. You're gonna do whatever makes you accepted. And that's just human nature. I started on pain pills. It was a Vicodin that I took for the very first time from my boyfriend and I had up until that point bragged like I, that I could not get addicted to anything. And so I, I took it kind of innocently, thinking this is, you know, just another drug I'm going to do and, and move on with my life. And I remember the first time that I took it feeling like this is it. I felt like it was what I had needed. It numbed me enough inside that it was like this is, I love this. Let's do this. We have this thing called social media. And it's now become cool to post pictures of yourself getting loaded at parties. And high schoolers are doing this on the regular. Getting loaded and the whole drug scene, it's looked upon as like a, a cool thing now. I've had buddies post videos of themselves snorting lines of cocaine and just getting hammered at parties. And then you look at all the comments on there, people would be like, save me a line. I've seen a lot of people towards the end of the party just laid out. I mean, people drawn on your face. You've just gotten so wasted. People have, like stripped you naked and like drug you outside and left you in the grass. Growing up in Westlake Village, you wouldn't think there were hard drugs. People drank and smoked weed. And that was pretty much the extent of it. But then inside of that is a little subculture of heroin addicts. It's a very hush-hush drug. You're not proud of it. You don't want other people to know, but you know who's doing heroin in your neighborhood. You get high with them, you pick up with them. So when you have friends and you're like, oh, you do heroin too? Okay, then you instantly connect. It was always easier to be cool in school than to do my study, you know, because if I had to work on it, I, it was too much of an effort. Life is tough, man. I said, you keep thinking this silver platter is going to come down out of the sky and you say, here it is, Joshua. Here's, here's your life. It's all set out for you. You know, you don't have to work. We can, you know, things will be given to you. I said, but by the time it's going to get to you, man, it's going to be splintered plywood because you have to work at it. Now, he wasn't afraid of work, but I always knew there was more for Josh than being a cook that he was. He loved to cook. Yeah. But I always knew there was something more that he could have done mm -hmm. with a little bit of effort. But it just seemed like he didn't want to put this effort. And the drug use becomes an easy way out. It's an easy way to cope. If your life isn't going the way that you planned it, well, it's an escape. It's a, it's a mask that they can use and say, well, if I can get enough money and I can get high a little bit and have a good time, well, life's okay, you know? It's okay for me to live in, in mom and dad's basement. I broke my thumb in the batting cages and I got a prescription of Vicodin. Um, I had done pain pills before then, um, here and there, but I was never really heavily addicted to them. Um, and I was actually sober at this time from like marijuana and drinking and cocaine and stuff. And I got the prescription and I was like, oh, I can handle this, it'll be okay. And they gave me 15 Vicodins. And as soon as I got the prescription filled, I took all 15 pills at one time. With the pain pills, it just like, you get high and you forget about everything. We have a hole inside of us. And I was trying to fill that hole with other things. And it was like a never ending cycle of just like death and destruction. I was using pills for 
probably a good three years before I was introduced to heroin. It was upper class kids. We were all hanging out and um, someone said, hey, have you ever tried heroin? You snort it just like you do pills. And maybe at that point you developed a habit, whether it's physical or just mental. And now you can just Google opiates, right? And what comes up, there's going to be a list of whatever it is you want, if it's medication. And it's somewhere in that list, there's going to be heroin. And at some point, that might be where a kid turns. But I just watched a documentary on the Silk Road. It's the dark web, and it was an actual drug dealing website. If you could access the dark web, you could get heroin shipped to you. Anywhere you live, it's that easy as yet you can order it online. You don't see a lot of people posting pictures of themselves shooting heroin or smoking speed on social media, but you can go on YouTube right now and look up videos of how to do heroin safely. They actually have videos like that. This was something that was unheard of 20 years ago. There's no such thing as how to do drugs safely. That wasn't comprehensible in any way, shape, or form. And then someone said, well, have you ever shot it up? And I was like, no, you know, I don't even know how to. I don't even know how to shoot it up. And so my boyfriend at the time was like, well, he had been secretly shooting up and I didn't know. And um, so I ended up, he ended up saying, well, let, let, let me shoot you up. It was an exciting thing. He's gonna shoot me up for the first time. We met in high school. I was the head of cheerleading and he was a football captain. I mean, we were top of our class. We were very popular. We weren't what you would look and say, oh, they, you know, they have a problem. We didn't go to any bad part of town to start doing drugs, it came to us. It was a very comfortable neighborhood. You know, everybody, you know, working families, but for the most part, you know, it was upper middle class as well. So all their kids went to college, everybody took vacations, and you know, we had barbecues. It was a nice neighborhood, a two-story house. Our kids went to a great school. We had all that we could, we thought, that we needed in life. I was injured at work. I uh, worked in a factory and um, hurt my back and had two surgeries. I was prescribed pain medicine, Percocet, and um, I went through about a year and a half of being very addicted to that, to the Percocet. After that, um, I went to the doctor and said, don't give me anything ever again. I was being given these medications so readily that it was from a doctor. I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. And by the time it was over, I had to sell my business. I was divorced and I was homeless and living in my vehicle. I was in a really bad car wreck. Some lady hit me at 65. They did a surgery on my back and they started giving me pain pills. I had never smoked weed, never done any drugs. And I'd just take them, take them, take them. It was just a vicious cycle that led to one day, they're like, hey man, we can't give them to you anymore. You have to go to a pain management. And there was like a three week gap in there. That's a travesty. It's a good person that was at one time given something that was supposed to help them. Now they can get it anywhere. Percocet, Vicodin, heroin, fentanyl, um, opioids. That's what they want, and you can get it without trying. You can walk through a normal neighborhood. You can walk two blocks, and I can find four people that have pills. And there's no stigma. Grandma's got these drugs. Grandma's got them for her knee. And Grandma doesn't understand that 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 you're addicted. Because, oh, he's just taking the same medicine doctor gave me. Here's two, honey. I had ran out of sources to purchase medication on the street. I was no longer getting it from the doctor. So I had been very ill and I was trying to still hold a job at that time. My clients knew something was wrong with me. I had a very large client base that were faithful. So when you're dealing with someone one-on-one -on, -one on a monthly basis and you have been for years, you know when something's off with them. So my credibility and the quality of my work had deteriorated so. And I was desperate, and I had a very big event that particular weekend. So uh, the person that I was dating at the time, 
um, said, well, we can either get you on Suboxone or we can buy heroin as a quick fix. Oh, you're dope sick. I'm like, man, I've never even smoked weed. I've never done nothing. And they're like, it doesn't matter. An opiate's an opiate. So he's like, try this. And that was the beginning of the end. To be honest, I thought that would make you an addict, right? If you do heroin, you're an addict. I mean, if you do something the doctor gave you, you're not an addict, right? I mean, this is my medicine, man. I need my medicine. But that guy over there, he's an addict because, you know, he's on heroin. Well, I think sometimes when people can't find anything, they take whatever they can find. And that's, that's how it leads from some medicine that your doctor gave you to crawling on the floor of your bathroom, looking for little pieces of a crushed up pill that you crushed up to sniff because it's going to take the pain away much quicker and you're missing your son's soccer. I think the first use for a lot of people is uh, something that is not always a pleasant experience. There's a lot of nausea associated with it. There's a lot of itchiness. There's a lot of physical symptoms. But I think if you're the type of person that can get past that, it's a downer. It's a depressant. I think it's been described to me as a soft, warm hug. But if you start to use it in regularity, probably somewhere between two and eight months, depending on your physiology, you're going to develop a dependence, a physical dependence. I think long before the physical dependence, you might develop a mental dependence. And, but that physical dependence is something that's going to come as a surprise because people don't know that being physically dependent on a substance means that it's going to really change your physiology. Being dope sick is the worst thing, worst feeling I've ever experienced. And I've gone through it so many times. You feel like you have the worst cold you've ever had in your life. You have chills, hot and cold. You have pins and needles just everywhere. Your anxiety is crawling. You feel uncomfortable in your own skin. Like you would do anything to make yourself feel better. Of course you're gonna go, you know, get more heroin or fentanyl or morphine so you can not feel bad. And it's night and day, it's night and day. You just wanna die. This is purely for you. So you can see what's going on here. Huh? Oh, you want to see me? Come on, honey. This is killing me. I work with this guy 50 hours a week. And then suddenly he's not functioning. A very high functioning one moment then sort of not so much, and then uh, low functioning, and then you don't see them anymore. I know big dudes, burly guys, factory workers, wasted away to nothing. Six months, a year, year and a half tops. They can't keep a bead. Keeping a bead means when you weld, and you lay a row of nickels down, and you can weld like a king, and you can do it fast. They can't do, they can't do this, because they can't stay up straight. Because they've either taken so much so that they don't hurt anymore, that they can't do a simple task. When you get to the place that you are physically addicted, without it, you wanna die. You have no hope. You are not only physically sick, but your mind is racing and you're depressed and you don't wanna get out of bed. You don't wanna brush your teeth. You don't want to roll over. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tormenting feeling. And you know that what's going to make you better and take that away from you is the dope. And the guilt just compounds itself over the years and the choices that you make and the things that you do. Our brain works on a reward system. So when we first start using the drugs, our brain rewarded that high. It said, this is good. You're a better person like this. I was always kind of shy, really insecure girl. And so to me, it gave me a boost of confidence, you know? I was on top of the world, and it's such a lie. It's a, it's a rough life. It's a really rough life. I once heard a story from a friend of mine who told me he was waiting for his drug dealer, and he was sitting in his car, and it felt like he had the flu times 10. And he was like, I was sweating, and then I was freezing, and it was like 90 degrees in my car. I felt like I was about to 
um, shit my pants and I couldn't like I, I was like squeezing and tensing my body up just waiting for this guy to bring me some drugs so I'd get loaded and my question to him was and that's kind of how, how how did you wake up every day and decide that was going to be your life like that's what I that's that's okay with me and he's like heroin is a hell of a drug you have no idea what your mind will tell you when you're on it addiction affects 30 percent of the population and it doesn't matter which direction you look. It doesn't matter if you're looking towards the bad neighborhood, the middle class neighborhood, or the wealthy neighborhood. It affects 30% of the population in any direction you look. So it really doesn't discriminate. I grew up in Xenia, Ohio, and I became a nurse at Good Samaritan Hospital here in Dayton. I worked in the ICU and all over the hospital. A large majority of my patients were hardcore drug addicts, and uh, we got a lot of overdoses um, that needed critical care to be able to be stabilized, and that cost quite a bit of money because the majority of the time they didn't have any kind of insurance. But it's the lifestyle that comes with it. It's also the cut that comes with it, and I think fentanyl is dangerous. If you're an addict, hearing that there's this really powerful opiate is that you're going to be inclined to think, great, here is something stronger. They're going to mix fentanyl in a bag or in a bowl. And the problem is that there's gonna be a stronger dosage in the corner of the bag than there is in the middle of it. And if you get that portion, I think there's a higher chance to overdose. You never really know what you're getting. Um, so this over here could be really strong and this over here could be like really weak. I would do like eight caps at one time. And like a friend of mine named Matthew, um, he passed away, but he would overdose right in front of me. Like he would die right in front of me shooting up two caps. And I would sit there and I'd be like, man, I better get high before the cops get here. Beginning of 2016, we see the shift of the fentanyl that came in. And Dayton, Ohio is the nation's number one city for heroin overdoses. There was this one day where I was walking down the street and I seen a body laying in the in in the uh, alley there. He had been dead and he had a needle still laying in his arm. And I was getting ready to call 911 and tell them, hey, there's somebody laying here. And this dude came out of the side of the alley and looked down at him and looked back up at me and grabbed the needle out of his arm and took off running. Because he needed a needle so bad so he wouldn't be sick, he took that needle and he ended up using it. It is tough. When he was offered jail or the program, he actually contemplated going to jail because he's he heard that the program was too tough. Nobody gets through it. And if you fail, you just you wind up going to jail anyway. So his thought was, well, I just may I may as well just go to jail now and get it over with. And I said, No, you know, come on, you know, you're smart, you're intelligent, you you can do this. You can do this. And he so he went into the the um, the Butler County rehab program. And he made it through all the phases. He actually, they actually graduated him uh, three months early because he was doing so well. Each person has their own narrative of how they got to where they are and what their previous experiences have been with treatment. Um, each person also has their own biology. And everyone has their own experience with various medications, other medical conditions that they have. And we take all of that along with what the, the client wants and try to put forth a plan that can help them. Oftentimes, they may involve buprenorphine, uh, commonly called Suboxone, very effective in helping people with withdrawal management. But there are a number of other medications that we give that provide comfort during the withdrawal process. And now there's even a new device called the bridge that we can install um, that's an electronic device that can help people with uh, withdrawal management. So we have a number of options that we try to present with the client, walk through with the client, and trying to pick out what's best to try to get them from point A to point B. You know, the goal is, what can I do today to keep this person from using today, place themselves at you know, risk of death? What can I do to just try to get them from today to tomorrow? From my experience and the people I've spoken to, methadone seems to be really effective because it tricks your brain into thinking that you have taken heroin. It's an opioid. And so your brain feels satisfied on a neurological level so you don't get cravings. You have a baseline and you use, and you go up to here and it feels great and it feels amazing. You use again because you come back down just a little bit further 
below baseline and you use again to go back up, but you don't ever quite go back up to that first time you used. And so you spend less time in the zigzag and then you're no longer even getting high. You're not even feeling good. You're just distorting your body and um, there's no way to ever, ever recreate that first high. Everything in your body is screaming for the drug. If you're given a choice when you're having a craving between your drug of choice and a roof over your head, you'll choose the drug over food, over clothes, over anything. Every cell in your body is screaming. You're desperately seeking it. If people only knew how strong the cravings were, they would understand why people don't stay clean. It's so hard. So cravings are, you can think of people when they suffer from addiction, this illness, that their brain lays down a memory, almost laying down a groove. And there can be circumstances uh, situations. There can be even colors, music, television programs, association with people and places that sparks that particular memory that the brain has, that particular groove, and then people start to desire to want to use that. And along with struggling with withdrawal, and once we get past that and going on to the cravings, those are the two major things that lead to people struggling with relapse. So there are ways that we can help folks with cravings. We can help them by redirecting their thoughts, changing activities, of course, trying to remove ourselves away from harmful situations that can reduce cravings. Uh, but the medications that can be prescribed also help reduce cravings. So methadone, which I don't prescribe, but methadone is an effective way to reduce cravings. Buprenorphine in its various forms is a very effective way to reduce cravings. And the extended release uh, naltrexone or Vivitrol also help reduce cravings. You mentioned cravings, and this is a big part of the illness, so big that a few years ago, you know, when we go to classify addiction or describe addiction, you know, uh, medical bodies now recognize cravings as a key core concept within the illness that needs to be addressed. Narcan works by producing the opposite effect of the drug. So when we have patients that, um, have overdosed, Narcan reverses the effects, and um, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty sudden rush. So um, these patients, when they wake up from Narcan, they're usually very angry, very violent. Um, they've lost their high. I'm at work, and I get a call, and it's his employer, and she's asking me if he's planning on coming to work today. You know, you get that little feeling, and I said, and it wasn't a bad feeling, but I said, uh, I'm just going to run by his place and check. And so I get to the house, and I knock, and no answer. I turn the handle on, on his, his door, and the door opened. In that neighborhood, your doors are never unlocked. I could hear the shower running. So again, I was like, oh, okay, he's, he's taking a shower, TV's on can't hear me. Finally, I'm at the bathroom door. It's cracked open. And I'm like, Josh, Josh. And I, I kind of open it slowly. I didn't want to pull the shower curtain back, but I knew I had to. He was sitting up. I just kind of crouched over. And, um, I just screamed his name, and I said, Josh! And I, I grabbed his shoulders, and I just shook him. I tried to feel for a pulse, and I, and I didn't feel anything, so I called 911. So they're trying to tell me to, uh, well, you got to do CPR, because you don't know how long he's been down. And I'm like, OK, or, yeah, I could do that. I, only, I think I only got to 30, and the paramedics were there. They were already walking in the bathroom. And so I just got up, and, and I went in the living room, and I sat down. He just said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. But he's gone. I mean, what do you mean he's gone? And the next thing, you know, they carry him out in a body bag. Drug addiction, gambling, food. Sex, these are all escapes, trying to get out of this inner war, chaos, so that I can breathe and I can have a moment. And opioids do it well. So does meth and cocaine, all addictive substances and, and practices, they get us out. The problem is, 
that it becomes more of the problem. So what start is, starts as a solution becomes more of a spiritual, emotional, and physical problem. Relapse is not always a bad thing. I definitely am not condoning it as part of anyone's recovery program, but the truth is most addicts will relapse, and if you use relapse correctly, it can really teach you a lot about yourself and prevent a relapse in the future. I know that any time I went to a group, you know, the times I did relapse and I was open about it, people were really supportive. You're not really supposed to talk about the specifics of your relapse. You know, you don't want to go to a group and talk about what you were doing because it might trigger somebody else. But you just own up to it. You're honest and then people give you more support. I know that, you know, when I went to a group and I told them I relapsed and look guys, I'm sorry, I used again. I had people making sure I was spending more time with them. You know, hey, come spend time with me. Let's go do something. People in NA or AA or any kind of group, they really want to help you. They really want you to succeed because they've succeeded and they want you to see how great recovery can be. So they definitely are there to support you. And while no group will condone relapse, they're also not going to make you feel bad about it because everyone, everyone who's in recovery has relapsed at least once, but realistically, probably dozens of times. Relapse is part of recovery for some people, but it's not for everybody. Sometimes you have to, you know, try it the harder way. You know, you have to do the quote unquote acid test and, you know, and see if it works or it doesn't work. You know, hey, I stopped. I think I have this under control. You know, maybe I can go back out and try drinking again or smoking pot again or whatever it might be. And you know what? Some people might be able to do that. Some kids might be able to do that, but not everybody's going to be able to. So my hope when I'm working with kids is that a seed is planted so they can go back to that if they need to, if their life becomes unmanageable again, if they start experiencing negative consequences again. And you know, the scary part, I guess, in the middle of that is that you hope you don't lose somebody. The last time I was ever arrested, I was arrested with an armed and dangerous warrant on me. The cops stopped me and said, the guns pulled on me and said, if you move, we're blowing your brains out. And the next morning I woke up in jail and I prayed this prayer. I was not raised in church, but this is my story. I said, all right, dude, <laughs> if you'll take this addiction from me, I'll serve you. And the Lord began speaking to me right then and right there. And I was sober for seven years after that. And after seven years, and I began ministering. I began being a motivational speaker at high schools. I went to college. I got a GED first, then I went to college. I got a degree in communication, then I became a minister. And then I became director of a faith-based drug program, the one that I had went through. I, I went back and became director of that program, and things were going great for me. And then I hit a storm, and I stumbled and after seven years of being sober, I relapsed. And it was at that time that I thought I'd never make it back out again. Things really got a lot worse for me that time. I really, really considered blowing my brains out on several occasions. On one occasion, one night in particular, I was really going to end my life. And my older brother, whom the relationship there was wounded, and it's still wounded today, he showed up to keep me from killing myself. But I thought I'd, I'd never make it out again. I thought there's no hope for me. I thought, I, you know, I, I relapsed. And when I relapsed, it hurt because all these people believed in me. And so I was hurt because I relapsed. And the only thing that would take that pain away was to use again. So I would use because I was hurt. And then I was hurt because I used. So I would use because I was hurt. And it just became this vicious cycle. I knew the way out, but I was too prideful to get out right away. My pride said it was better for me to suffer privately than to be set free publicly. I really had to come to the place where I humbled myself again and said, I need help. I had one particular incident where I was in someone's home and I was in their basement on a concrete floor with a blanket. 
And I was not only um, withdrawing from opiates, but also the uh, benzos or Xanax. And that was the worst withdrawal I've ever been through in my life. Xanax are similar to alcohol. The withdrawal will kill you from those if it's not managed correctly. I didn't know that. And I actually had to be hospitalized at that point. And I had come into a lump sum of money and had blown through a lot of uh, pills and Xanax. And uh, by the time that was over, I, I was at the bottom again. But it still wasn't the furthest that I went. So you're continually chasing the feeling of numbness. And you're not really doing it anymore for euphoria. I wasn't doing it to get high anymore. I was doing it because I just didn't want to feel anything. And at this point, I was homeless. I had lost custody of my children. I hated myself. I hated my life. And just so that I didn't want to die every day, I put a needle in my arm. We're not paying our bills. They're repossessing our car. We're losing our home. We literally have no money and begging my mom to bring groceries. Now, at this point, we're not providing for our kids. By the end of our addiction... We are spending three, $400 a day. A day. I would go to, like, a um, rent-to-own and buy a TV. And pawn it. And then go straight to the pawn shop and pawn it. By the end, I was so tired of the guilt and the shame that you feel about a month into getting clean. You get some emotions that you ain't had in four years, like, what did I do? And we would use to make it go away. And that demon on your shoulder is like, you can do a little bit now. We did love getting high for that time. The high of going to get it, the needle itself, the whole process was an addiction. And then it got to where, where I controlled it. In a very short time, it controlled me. And everything around us like thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. We were losing our house. We had wrecked both vehicles. Um, we had beat each other up almost like in fights. Like one point, both of us had wrapped up hands. <laughs> like it just got so ugly. And because I, I had lost custody of my kids, I thought that this was my life. You know, I'm gonna die like this. And I actually got to the place where I was begging God. Like, don't let me wake up. You know, like, let me die. I want to die. This is happening. What do you have to say about this? Hey. Happening. The turning point was having no veins left. Spending eight hours a day in a bathroom trying to hit a vein? Shane, you're killing yourself, dude. You can put me in jail for three days. Every time I went to jail, I said I was done. And I'd get out, and I'd get high. I just didn't want to live that life anymore. I was looking at four years and eight months in prison, and I had reached out to an organization called Beit Deshuva, and Beit Deshuva let me come for free, and they gave me a job, and they nursed me back to life. I still am close with the rabbi. So am I Jewish? Yes, probably, but... I believe that I'm here for a reason. Shana is an amazing young woman. She knows how to wrestle with her own demons. And she's of tremendous service. She got her license in cosmetology and all the things that she thought she could never do. And she's unafraid of being seen. In fact, that's all she wants is to be seen. That's what recovery is. You see me. This is who I am. You're getting me. At the end of our addiction, we had lost everything. Our kids had decided they didn't want to be around us anymore. And we were living in this nasty crack motel. And our daughter came to the hotel. She had been at church that morning. She said she went to the altar and said, God, give me the courage to confront my parents. 
So we're sitting in that motel and we're sick. And the door, someone's beating on the door. We open the door up and it's, it's our daughter. And she's like, I don't know what's wrong with you guys, but you need to get help. And if you don't get help, you will not have us in your life anymore. So at that time, we were like, we don't know what to do. We're like, we're going to get help. So we found, actually, um, the Darling Bishop Home for Life here on the property. We said, okay, we'll go do whatever we got to do, not knowing what that looked like. And um, we both got saved. My come to Jesus moment, as my family put it, and myself, I called them from jail. And I was facing um, an assault with a deadly weapon charge. Previous to that, just a few months before, I was involved in an incident where a man had beat me for over two and a half hours, kidnapped me, and the only way that I could get away from him was driving my own car after he had hopped out. He told me he was going to bury me in a park here in, in our town. And when he hopped out, I finally had an opportunity to get away. And he hopped on top of the vehicle. It had a luggage rack, and he held on to it, and I wouldn't stop. And he fell off, and he had severe head injuries, and he died. So I was looking at manslaughter charges. That wasn't enough. I still ran for another almost eight months, and things got even worse. And a friend at the time from our church here, I contacted, and I said, listen, I am in a lot of trouble, and I need, I need help. But if you don't ask for help, you're not going to find it. And if you don't ask for help, there's only one way. There's nobody that ever took drugs to the point where they got cool. Hey, I'm great. Yeah, I just took all the drugs I could find. I'm Keith Richards, man. I'm good. I would say to you, bro, you need help. Sister, you need help. And if you don't know anybody, see, you don't know anybody. and I don't got nobody that cares. I pushed them all away. They find you passed out on the floor, or you're homeless, or you got nothing, or there's a needle in your arm, or your, your kids find you dead. Okay, you, you don't want to talk about embarrassing or jacked up. Or do you want to live? How much time do we have? How much time do we have on this earth? I would say ask for help. Say turn to somebody that you know at one time really loved you. Tell them you're sorry. Say just help. Run to the doctor. Turn yourself into the police. Go to a homeless shelter. Anything's better than dying. Anything's better than, anything's better than dying empty and without purpose and without cause. That's what I would say. It, it's not been easy, no. but it's been worth it. Yeah. You know, we, you just, it recovery's up. It's not a one month process. It's not a two month process. I mean, we're coming up on three years and we're still working it out. I mean, you gotta, you gotta get up every day and, and, and say today, I'm gonna stay clean again. In recovery, because I'm not concerned about sobriety. I know a lot of people who've been, who are sober who do terrible things. I'm concerned with recovery. Recovery means I'm recovering my spirit. I'm recovering uh, uh, my integrity. I'm recovering my passion for life and I'm discovering a purpose. I'm here for a reason. So this inner pain, this inner chaos, this inner war manifests itself as somatic diseases. So when a doctor gives you a pill for uh, um, surgery, the pain goes away. What do you do when, when the pills stop? You need something to take that pain away unless you have a rich spiritual life rich inner life. When I walked in those doors on March the 5th, my life changed. And I decided that I was going to fully surrender. I like to fix things, and I like to have control of things. I think I'm a typical woman. <laughs> but I, for the first time in my life, was willing to fully surrender. And what changed my heart was truly finding the grace and the love of God. And when I experienced the love of the Father after being in a lot of abuse and having so many traumatic things happen to me, I finally had peace. And the depression and the anxiety that I had experienced that was not controlled with medication. I now am in ministry at the church, and I'm the administrative assistant for our church. And I am trusted with such great things on a daily basis. And to have people's trust and respect is worth it all. 
I try to help women get into the Darling Bishop Home for Life, and I'm a volunteer there. And he helps with Genesis, and it's amazing. And God just repeatedly has shown himself to us and our faithfulness and our walk and our family and even getting our home back, our um, you know, our jobs, the just abundantly keeps on showing up and showing out. But anything good is a process. Yeah. You can't like get, you can't quit using because God has grace and mercy, but the world don't. And knowing that God's on our side and, and that we can make it through anything. We don't have to lean on that drug to fill that emotion anymore. When we have those emotions that together we can, you know, fight through it with God has been the, what's carried us through all this. And we just traded the chemical addiction for a spiritual addiction. <laughs> I think it's because we're more educated now. Everybody used to look away from it. Even baby boomers, people are going to die from this. And unfortunately, those are the consequences. Addiction is just ripping America apart. I say in my groups, like, look next to you and look around because most of you won't make it. Some of you will, but not everybody. And I've been to so many funerals, I don't even go anymore. Whether you go to rehab or, you know, go to a methadone clinic, and that's where the work begins. You know, you have to go to your groups. And I think after the initial shock of not using drugs every day kind of wears off and you get into a comfortable routine going to your meetings or whatever it is that you choose to do, then you start to work on yourself. You kind of look inwards and you take inventory of your life and you start to fix things one at a time. You might work on your relationships, maybe work on getting a job again, trying to establish normality in your life. Listen to the people that are around you and that love you. If you have a problem, get help. There's no condemnation. There's no shame. If I can do it, if he can do it, anyone can get clean. And, you know, our situations and circumstances, they vary. We didn't use together, but our hearts are the same. And we know that you can be free. You just are one choice away. And choosing to be in the correct treatment and choosing to know that you are special, you are important, and you're not alone. I would say, um, come as you are. The Bible says, come as you are. So many times I thought I had to get cleaned up to go to God. And God is not that kind of God. He says, bring me your mess, bring me your troubles, bring me your guilt, bring me your shame, bring me your heartache, bring me your addiction. And just start there, just on your knees. God, here it is. If we wait till we're cleaned up to come to Him, we'll never make it, we'll never get there. And I think that's what we did. We tried to clean up ourselves. Yeah. And, and for me, it was, come to God, come to Jesus, and pursue a relationship with Him. Not a religion. You know, you can speak all the Christianese in the world, I believe, and be going to hell. And, and that was one of the things that I learned at the Darling Bishop Home for Life. It was, it was pursue God like you would a relationship. Begin to talk to Him. And you know what I found out? He wants to talk to me too. So it was, it was always me talking to God and him, me feeling like He didn't care. But when I began to think, he wants to hear what I have to say, and he wants to share things with me too, it became relational. And you, it's not easy to turn your back on something you've invested in and you have a relationship in. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus, God, he is a, he is a person of relationship. He wants to love you till the shame falls off, till the guilt falls off, till the addiction falls off. And, and don't worry about having to do it yourself. And, and he'll so, help you see yourself from a different perspective. Yeah. When you always view yourself as a drug addict, mm -hmm. you'll reproduce drug addict tendencies. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to see yourself as a child of God, then you'll begin to act differently. You'll think differently. You'll behave differently. To the artistic person, I would say, do you know yourself? Do you mean to tell me that you're a better artist today than you were when this started? Really? Can you hit all those notes? Can you sing it? Do you hear the music? Do you feel the music? Or can you only do it when you're high? I would suggest that you have to be self-aware enough to know that you're not who you used to be and that you need help. I mean, there's lots of avenues for help. My personal belief is that uh, 
Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one enters the kingdom of heaven except by through him, and that all things are possible through Jesus Christ, which strengthens me. That's how I did it. Hundreds of people I know, and I live in the middle of nowhere, they're going through the exact same thing. And if you don't try to get help, you're going to die. You're going to lose everything that you had. You're going to lose everyone that you cared about. And you're not too cool. You're not too smart. You're not too tough. You're not too clever. It's happened to everybody. Right before I hit the ground, son, how you came along and found me. It's 90 miles on the highway. Every day moving so fast, taking all the wrong ways out. Never saw you coming, stopping me in my tracks, keeping me from the long way down. Doesn't matter just how many times I tried, there could only be a single reason why. So tell me, I don't need just happen like that, happen like that, happen like that. You can see the stars align, but I know that it's more than time. And I don't need it goes. Just happen like that, happen like that, happen like that. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. About two weeks ago, I got a call I never expected, and one of the hardest losses, someone passing away from substance abuse. I'm still processing it myself. It's been, besides my grandfather, the second hardest death I've ever had to kind of go through, and she worked for me for eight years, and. I think she's going to walk in and I'm going to hear her annoying laugh coming in the door as she walks in, plops on my couch and, John! <laughs> Shana became addicted to opiates in high school when she was a softball pitcher and she had to get surgery and from pain pills to ultimately what took her life, I guess 15 years later, fentanyl and I mean she's 35 she just had a lot to do and a lot she wanted to do and it was so sudden and kind of not I mean it's not expected if you're a counselor you're in recovery and she was and that one more time that one more time on a Sunday night she probably thought she'd come on Monday and no one would know and she didn't get that chance to come I say in my groups, like, look next to you and look around because most of you won't make it, is the truth. Some of you will, but not everybody. Some of us are going to die. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. Some will say it's magic. But I know that you did all that You're the reason, there's no doubt Doesn't matter just how many times I tried There could only be a single reason why So tell me I don't knew it goes Just happen like that Happen like that Happen like that You can see the stars align But I know that it's more than time And I don't knew it goes just happen like that, happen like that, happen like that. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. There's no doubt when I feel your love Call me crazy and out of touch But I know that it's from above Tell me You can see the stars align, but 
I know that it's more than timing. I don't need it, goes just happen like that, happen like that, happen like that. Right before I hit the ground, so how you came along and found me. You can see the stars align, but I know that it's more than timing. Before I hit the ground, son, how you came along and found me.